Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 6, Mycenaean Greece. At about the time that Thera was destroyed by its volcanic eruption, the Mycenaean Greeks were just beginning to emerge into their civilization stage, after several centuries of learning from the more advanced Minoan culture to their southeast. They were the up-and-comers, and it was perfect happenstance the Minoans' commercial prowess was weakened significantly by this volcano. A few centuries later, the war-hungry Mycenaeans put the final nail in the proverbial Minoan coffin and ungratefully repaid their cultural teachers by invading Crete, and taking over their power centers. But how were they able to accomplish this feat? Where did this military and commercial prowess come from? To answer these questions, let's first backtrack a bit and try to piece together a historical narrative of Mycenaean society and their resurgency from the 16th century BC onward, a period Evans called Late Helladic. Our knowledge of Mycenaean society is pieced together from the evidence on Linear B tablets and the archaeological remains, as well as Homer, albeit with a certain level of skepticism attached. Towards the end of the Middle Helladic period, we see a significant increase in population, and a number of power centers emerged in southern and central Greece, dominated by a warrior elite society. The site of Mycenae was well placed to be a center of power. Some 12 miles inland, at the northeast corner of the Argive Plain, it had good farmland a strong defense and strategic position, and an adequate water supply. Built on a hill rising some 900 feet above sea level, it overlooked the Argive Plain and commanded easy routes to the Isthmus of Corinth for commercial and military operations by sea. Mycenae may have been the most powerful and prosperous settlement on the Greek mainland, but regardless of what Homer may have portrayed, there is no reason to believe that there was a unified kingdom of Greece ruled by the king of Mycenae. The Mycenaeans, in fact, were not a unified political unit, but a conglomeration of numerous small kingdoms, each controlling an area of land in their region of influence, some larger and smaller than the rest. With that being said, in the large region of the Argolid, where ten important late Helladic sites were close together, including Mycenae and Tyrants, it's entirely possible that the king of Mycenae exercised control over all sites in his region, or at the very least, They were semi-independent settlements whose leaders acknowledged the superiority of Mycenae and pledged their loyalty to him. Other major Bronze Age centers were found at Athens and Attica, the island of Salamis, Thebes and Orchomenus in Boeotia, Iolcus in Thessaly, Amaclai, which is Sparta, in Laconia, and Pylos in Mycenae. Our earliest evidence for the Mycenaeans comes from the archaeological findings by Schliemann. Thanks to the shaft graves at Mycenae, we know that by 1600 BC, the highly developed Minoan civilization on Crete had begun to exercise a dominant influence on Mycenaean culture. The contents of two circular burial grounds, reserved for the elite families, have shed much light on Mycenae's early development. The graves in the two burial grounds are called shaft graves, because the bodies were lowered straight down into a deep rectangular shaft cut into the ground. Prized possessions were laid beside the body to accompany the deceased. Grave Circle A is located inside the entrance to Mycenae, almost immediately to the right. There were six graves enclosed, containing altogether 19 burials, covering roughly 1600 to 1500 BC. Upright limestone blocks, called stelae, or grave markers, were found. Three of these graves were very rich and are probably the graves of kings with their queens and immediate family while the other three may have been for more distant relatives. Schliemann found in these graves all sorts of precious objects, such as gold death masks, gold signet rings, with scenes of human combat and hunting, jewelry, such as necklaces, crowns, earrings, and so forth, gold panels for decoration, bronze breastplates, swords, daggers, some of which are ornate with scenes of hunting, axes, a bull's head right and ornate with gold, numerous clay pots painted in magnificent styles, and silver and golden cups. Homer had a reason for describing Mycenae as rich in gold. Some of the finer treasures were made with imported precious materials from Crete and the Near East, and were either imitations or the actual work of Minoan craftsmen. 
One of the graves had a face remarkably well preserved beneath its gold funerary mask. Its function probably was either to rest on top of the body upon burial or to be worn during religious ceremonies. Since it makes things more interesting to attach finds to a mythical king, Schliemann sent a telegram to the king of Greece saying that he had gazed upon the face of Agamemnon. But in reality, the remains date to several centuries before the probable date of the Trojan War. Also, it has been proven that Schliemann has forged some of the treasures. The so-called death mask of Agamemnon, probably included. In fact, it doesn't look anything like any of the other death masks at all, and this one seems to have a very German appearance. It's very probable that Schliemann forged a mask after his own facial image. Another artifact that Schliemann erroneously attributed to a Homeric king was a golden vessel he identified as the Cup of Nestor, as described in the Iliad. A butaceous cup studded with bosses of gold. It had four handles, and about each doves were feeding, while below were two supports. Another man could scarcely have lifted the cup from the table when it was full, but Nestor would raise it easily. But the cup he found not only dates much earlier than the time of the Trojan War, but this cup found at Mycenae differs from Homer's description in several respects. Apart from being much smaller, Nestor was the king of Pylos, not Mycenae. The cup has two handles, whereas Homer's cup has four. Homer's cup has two doves per handle, but this cup has a single falcon for each handle. As you can see, Schliemann was trying to fantasize his finds again. However, that shouldn't take away from the fact that these objects are exquisite. A grave circle outside the walls of Mycenae was found much later in 1952, and thus was called Grave Circle B, to distinguish it from Schliemann's graves, even though it dates somewhat earlier, to roughly 1650 to 1550 BC. There were 14 shaft graves enclosed, and they contained many bronze weapons and local pottery, but very little gold or jewelry. These were probably the graves of leading nobles, rather than the kings themselves. Regardless, the increasing wealth of the shaft graves reveals the evolving power of the ruling class in Mycenae over roughly 100 to 150 years, as they were having more and more contact with the Cyclades and Crete and becoming significant players in the pan-Mediterranean economy. Mycenaean presence appears to also be depicted in a fresco at Akrotiri, which possibly displays many warriors in Mycenaean helmets. How this wealth was suddenly accumulated at Mycenae is unknown. The weaponry underscores the people's warlike nature, so the wealth may have come from pirating or mercenary activities. One interesting theory states that the Mycenaeans fought as mercenaries in Egypt during the 16th century BC, a time when the Egyptians threw off Hyksos' rule and established native control of the country, and sparked what is called the New Kingdom of Egypt. It's entirely plausible that the Mycenaeans would have been recruited and well paid for with gold for their services in this endeavor. The Mycenaeans could have been annoying enough as pirates that the Egyptians felt the need to eliminate them by hiring them. But this is all just conjecture. Although there's evidence that the Mycenaeans were employed by the Egyptians later as mercenaries, there's no way of knowing if it was early enough to account for these hordes of gold. Whatever the reason, they were definitely getting rich from something, somewhere. Shortly before 1500 BC, the Mycenaean elites adopted a different type of tomb, called a tholos, which provides further evidence of their growing power and wealth. A total of nine have been preserved at Mycenae, located outside of the citadel to the west. Tholoi, the plural, have been found throughout Greece and were the highest achievement of Mycenaean engineering. They were very large round chambers, shaped like beehives, cut into a hillside. Their centers rose almost 50 feet above the ground and almost 50 feet in diameter. The vault of the Tholos implements the corbelled vaulting technique, but in a circular course. They got such a high height because smaller stones were used. The high vaulted burial and ceremonial chamber was approached through a long stone-lined passageway, called a dromos, and huge bronze doors, and was covered by an earthen mound to look like a hill. The dromos would have been filled in as a means to prevent tomb raiding although they still had varying degrees of success. Some tholos have collapsed over time, but the so-called treasury of Atreus has remained intact and is the best preserved, mentioned and named by Pausanias. It was still visible when Schliemann discovered it. The tomb probably has no relationship with Atreus. 
More on him later. As archaeologists believe it is dated much earlier. Its entrance had a lintel block weighing 120 tons and an invisible relieving triangle. The 16 and a half feet high door frame was covered with green veneer and had elaborate columns. This was the largest dome until the construction of the Roman Pantheon. The burial chamber was actually a side chamber. Based upon the rich goods that he found, Schliemann called these Tholos tombs as treasuries. The Tholos represents the height of Mycenaean upper-class ostentation. We may see it as a conspicuous statement of their arrival on the wider Mediterranean scene. Unfortunately, most of the Tholoi were robbed centuries ago, but the few that remained intact have yielded burial gifts even more bountiful and beautiful than those of the shaft graves. The royal families that owned these tombs were far richer and more thoroughly Minoanized. Many of the later burials in the Tholoi overlap in time with the construction of the great palaces in the 14th and 13th centuries BC, whose ruins we can still see today. The best preserved palaces are found at Pylos and Tyrants, while Mycenae is only partially preserved. Thebes and Orchomenus have only been partially exposed, since both are buried under modern buildings in the busiest center of town. On the other hand, the Bronze Age palace at Athens has been almost completely destroyed. A substantial building has been unearthed at Domini in Thessaly, believed to be ancient Iolcus, but is not big enough to be considered a palace. Regardless, the palatial structures of mainland Greece all had a number of distinctive features, and the architecture and decoration of these Mycenaean palaces closely followed the Minoan style, though with some notable differences. For one, the Mycenaean palaces were much smaller and were usually built on top of a formidable hill, called a citadel, with high, thick defensive walls. The citadel was reserved for the inhabitants of the palace, and a limited number of nobles, upon whom the king relied for consul, had living chambers inside the walls. The agricultural workers and craftsmen who were not working for the palace lived outside the walls. If there were attackers, everyone would head up to the citadel, which provided a place of refuge for its unfortified inhabitants. None of the citadels were right on the sea, since attacks could come quickly from the sea, but none were too far from the shore, since their civilization was commercially based. Whereas the Minoan palaces had little defensive function, defense seems to have been the paramount consideration for the Mycenaeans. Pylos, though, was the only exception in being undefended. But immensely strong fortification walls can be seen at Tyrants and Mycenae, the ladders being 40 feet high and 20 feet thick. They were constructed with huge blocks of limestone, packed with small stones and clay. Legend had it that the mythical one-eyed giants, the Cyclopes, who worked in the forge, had built it. Thus they were called Cyclopean walls by later Greek visitors. The fortifications were well engineered, taking full advantage of the natural slopes. The walls also had tunnel access for soldiers to maneuver and fortified archer stations, allowing defenders to fire down on two sides at attackers, storming the entrance into Mycenae. Regardless, in order to construct, maintain, and repair these walls, it called for huge expenditures of material resources, and the labor force of many hundreds of people. Such huge impregnable walls were much more than what was necessary to stave off an enemy assault. But having these walls was as much a boast about the wealth of the king and his military might as it was a defense for his palace and people. The Lion's Gate, so called due to the famous nine and a half foot relief of two lions in profile flanking a Minoan column, sits above the entrance at Mycenae. It compares to the gates of the Hittite capital of Hattusa. Their heads are missing though. Pausanias describes them as being lions, but he didn't mention if their heads were there at that time or not which leads some scholars to suspect that they may have been sphinxes in typical Near Eastern tradition. A sphinx had the body of a lion and a head of a human. The Mycenaeans also utilized space within the palaces in one notably different way from the Minoans. In place of the massive open paved courtyard of the Minoan complexes, which were probably used for religious spectacles, the Mycenaeans had a considerably smaller courtyard and made the focus of their palace the Megaron, a large rectangular great hall. It was the heart of the palace and was entered by a vestibule and portico in the front. In the middle stood a large, raised circular hearth, flanked by four columns that supported the roof. A kind of chimney was built into the roof above the hearth to allow smoke to escape. For the Mycenaeans, the Megaron was the ceremonial center of the palace, 
as it was here that the king received distinguished visitors and took counsel with his advisors, where royal banquets were held and public sacrifices were made. The Megaron at Pylos is the best preserved of all Mycenaean sites. Located around the Megaron is a group of courtyards that lead to smaller rooms for storerooms, workshops, reception halls, and living quarters. The staircases in the palace at Pylos indicate that the palace had two stories. The private quarters of the royal family were presumably located on the second floor. The iconography of the palaces is remarkably uniform throughout Greece. In the case of Pylos and Tyrants, the palaces are decorated with brightly colored frescoes on the walls, roof beams, ceilings, and floor, focusing on marine life, such as octopi, fish, and dolphins, which strongly resembles those at Knossos, showing even more Minoan artistic influence on the mainland Greeks. In general, Mycenaean palaces have yielded a wealth of fragmentary frescoes. There was also a different attitude toward lighting. The light wells designed to give as much light as possible to Minoan rooms are not found in Mycenaean palaces, which must have been considerably darker. Regardless, the Mycenaean palaces provided their inhabitants a standard of luxury, refinement, and beauty, almost as high as that of the Minoans. Although they had fewer rooms and lacked some of the architectural embellishments of the Minoans, the Mycenaean palaces boasted such Minoan achievements as indoor plumbing and beautiful wall paintings. Although Mycenaean frescoes were heavily influenced by Minoan artistic style, the nature-loving depictions of the Minoans were replaced by images of nature and animals, but in their relation to man. Furthermore, they show a preference for martial themes, such as personal combats, sieges, and hunting scenes. The Linear B tablets help to shed light on the Mycenaean palace system of administration. These clay tablets were preserved only because they were baked in the fires that destroyed the palaces. There'll be more on that later. What we have, in other words, are palace scribes' notes on personnel and production, which pertain to only a small part of the last year of the palaces where they were found. Nonetheless, they reveal much about the day-to-day -day administrative details of the highly regimented production and distribution system of the Mycenaean palaces in the late Helladic period. The tablets give us some idea of Mycenaean ruling hierarchy. A Mycenaean king had supreme command over the army and state, just as the Mesopotamian kings and Egyptian pharaohs. They also oversaw all economic and religious activity, but were assisted by a group of bureaucrats, who commanded the servants and recorded the goods. Basically, the king had centralized control, and everything stemmed from him. The tablets refer to Mycenaean kings as Wanox meaning a powerful lord or master, that held royal domain. Most of the tablets are inventories of the king's possessions in the palace. There was no reference in the tablets to law or administration of justice, but it's more than likely that the king had authority in these areas. Mycenaean society was very stratified and bureaucratic. The next level down was the king's entourage, and his second in command was the law Gettys, which seems to mean something like leader of the people. He probably was the head of the army while the king ran the palace, although the king would have been present on the field in major battles. The king and the law Geddes each possessed a temenos, or landed estate, although the latter's was a third of the size of the king's. There was also a high-ranking group called Telestai, who received the same allotment of land as the law Geddes. Their function is unknown, but they may have been the priests. Others, with the title Hequetes, possibly meaning companions or followers, may have been high-ranking military officers, similar to the Hatairoi of later Greece. A council of elders to advise the king was called the Kerosiwa, which in later Greek would be called Gerosia. Below these men were lesser officials, who appear to have been in charge of the outlying areas for the larger kingdoms, like Pylos, whose domain in Mycenae contained over 200 villages and towns and was divided into several districts, with each named after the principal town in their district. The titles Karete and pro Karete, found on the tablets, may have belonged to the governor of a district and his deputy. The Damokuru, or the ones who take care of a damos, or people, from which we can see the later Greek word demos, probably refers to someone in charge of each district. There also was a large group of officials with the title Pasiru, who were in charge of affairs at the town and village level. 
Pasiru was probably the earlier form of the Homeric Basileus. More on that in future episodes. Below all of these men listed were numerous low-level functionaries, who were just as dependent on them as they themselves were dependent on the Wanox. The tablets reveal that the higher officials received land from the Wanox in return for their service to the palace and a share of their crops. A similar relationship undoubtedly existed between such officials and their subordinates. The highest officials occupied private homes on the citadel. Some are quite large. Only the highest ranking families were buried in the ostentatious Tholoi, though. The families of the lesser elite lived in the lower towns and out in the countryside, and were buried in smaller, simpler tombs like the shaft graves, though they could contain great amounts of expensive grave goods. The majority of the people, though, lived in small homes and were buried in simple graves, with only a couple of vases or other small items. Needless to say, very few luxury items were found in the houses and graves of the common people. They made their living as farmers, herders, and artisans. It appears from the tablets that most families farmed as tenants on Temenoi, belonging to the nobles, although some non-nobles, who were herders and artisans, held land in their own names. The palace's supervision over the people was very thorough. Officials were sent out into the countryside on regular inspections, and the produce and the animals levied on individuals and villages were meticulously recorded, including any shortages. However, it does appear that the farmers weren't too heavily taxed. The evidence from the tablets does not support any view of oppressed peasants being squeezed dry by their overlords. All in all, the men of the village probably had a typical Bronze Age life. They farmed their plots, paid their taxes, and served in the army. The women probably helped with farm chores and performed the domestic tasks of spinning and weaving, food preparation, and child care. A number of village women also engaged as textile workers for the palace, for which they received rations of wool and flax. There are remains of four substantial houses outside of the walls of Mycenae. Three have been named from their contents. The House of the Oil Merchant, the House of the Shields, and the House of the Sphinxes from an ivory-carved plaque. The fourth has no distinct features and thus is given the colorless name of West House. The interest in these houses lies in that there has been a discovery of clay tablets, similar in form and style to those in the palaces at Knossos and Pylos. If these were workshops and acted as a subsidiary of the palace administration, surely they wouldn't have been left unprotected outside the walls. They were probably homes of rich merchants, which implies that not all trade was controlled from the palace. Furthermore, a tablet has been found at a second-tier town called Iklana which was under the control of Pylos administratively. This all suggests that the ability to write in the Linear B script extended to some people outside of palace scribes. It also suggests that the power of Mycenaean kingdoms might have been more extensive than originally thought as well, with writing allowing them to keep track of the production and communities much farther away. The lowest rung in Mycenaean society was the Doru, Doulos in later Greek or slaves, who have been recorded in service of the palace or for specific duties. References to the terms for captive and bot indicate that the Mycenaeans were active in the slavery business, although some may have been purchased or traded for. They commonly made raids and hauled off slaves from the Anatolian coast especially, which we know because they have been recorded with their place of origin, places like Lemnos, Halicarnassus, Chios, and so on. The number of slaves were high, very many of whom are female. The tablets from Pylos record over 600 slave women, for example, who worked as grinders of grain, bath attendants, flax workers, weavers, and so forth. Most of the women listed were attached to the palace in some capacity, although high-ranking individuals also owned a few domestic slaves, freeing their owners from every sort of menial labor. Throughout their history, the Greeks would find this combination of benefits irresistible and it has been said that Greek civilization, as well as that of the Romans in the United States, were built on slavery. While this is an overgeneralization, it is true nonetheless that slavery was a paramount institution, and its morality remained largely unquestioned. It was practiced everywhere in the Greek world, and at all periods. The practice of slavery, on a really massive scale, wouldn't come until much later in the historical period, however. 
The military ethos of the Mycenaean Greeks is evident by the numerous weapons unearthed, warrior and combat representations in contemporary art, as well as what is preserved on the Linear B tablets. The Mycenaeans invested in the development of military infrastructure, with military production and logistics being supervised directly from the palatial centers. It's no surprise that the military also was socially stratified. The officers came from the nobility, while the ranks were levied from among the farmers and craftsmen. Linear B tablets record that every damas was obliged to supply a certain number of men who had to serve in the army. The palace directed all military operations. Troop movements of rowers and coastal watchers, and all the disbursements of weapons and rations for the soldiers are recorded on the tablets. The actual organization of the military is unknown, however. From various depictions on pottery, we know that there were ships of various sizes and therefore different numbers of oarsmen. This all seems to corroborate Homer, who in the Iliad describes warships of various numbers of oars, varying from 20 oared to 50 oared. The palatial centers also organized the construction of several large-scale projects, like harbors, to accommodate their ships. There's also a network of roads and bridges that radiated out from Mycenae, connecting it to the other major centers. It surely would have sped up and made easier the deployment of troops. Weapons and armor are well known from material evidence in graves, depictions on paintings, and inventory lists on Linear B tablets. The emphasis on weapons and tombs suggests that the Mycenaean period was one of much fighting, and this is supported by Greek tradition, which remembers feuds within states and between states. Of fighting overseas, we hear only of the war against Troy. There will be more on that next episode. A complete set of Mycenaean bronze armor found in a tomb from Dendra in the northeastern Peloponnese, dating to the 14th century BC, shows how extensive first-class equipment could be. A Mycenaean warrior wore a complete bronze cuirass, or chest guard, made up of two pieces for the front and back, an adjustable skirt of bronze plates, bronze greaves, or shin guards, shoulder plates, and a collar. The typical helmet was made out of cut segments of boar tusks, sewn into a leather or cloth backing, with metal cheek pieces. Their shields were made of two types, figure eight and rectangular. Both were made of wood and oxide, and were very large in order to shield their entire body. The offensive weapons at their disposal were bronze thrusting swords and daggers, heavier bronze-tipped thrusting spears, lighter throwing javelins, bows and arrows, maces, axes, and slings. How these weapons were combined in battle and the tactics employed by the commanders is not fully known. However, the use of the sword is well illustrated in scenes of duels on seals and rings, and the astonishing number of swords found in shaft graves makes me believe that one-on-one duels may have been an important element in the battles, although not necessarily as described by Homer, for reasons we will discuss in future episodes. We have to take a Homer's account of the Trojan War with a grain of salt in regards to Mycenaean military tactics and formations. During the 13th century BC, There was radical change in Mycenaean weaponry. As weapons became smaller and lighter, the new equipment is most comprehensively illustrated in the warrior vase from Mycenae. It depicts a woman on the far left, waving farewell to a group of soldiers moving away from her. The large body shields were now out of date, replaced by a much smaller shield, usually round with a small segment cut from the bottom. They were made of oxhide and sometimes had a center made of bronze. The helmet is made of leather. The bulky bronze cuirass has given way to a lighter version, presumably made of leather also. The soldiers are wearing a kilt and leather leggings. The only weapon shown is the spear. There is no image of a sword, but it would be dangerous to argue from such pictures as this that the sword was not used. The painter may have not wanted to overcrowd the picture. Armored cavalry fighting was not known in the Bronze Age. However, we do know that the Mycenaeans employed the use of two-wheeled chariots. Because the chariot was light, a pair of horses could carry it, and two passengers for many miles at a pace previously unknown on land. A single horse and rider could go faster, but only for a shorter distance. These revolutionary vehicles, assumed to have been introduced during the Indo-European migrations, first appeared not long after 2000 BC in various Near Eastern societies and made their way to Greece around 1600 BC. 
after its military use had been perfected by the Hittites most likely. Unlike in the Near East, it is generally believed, however, that in Greece, its military use was restricted to transmitting heavily armored elite warriors to and from the fighting, as described in the Homeric epics, like a taxi cab. The man getting dropped off could use his thrusting spear from the chariot or shoot arrows at the enemy. However, it is hard to imagine mass formations of chariots charging across the mountainous terrain of Greece, although it is possible that small chariot warfare battles could have occurred in the spacious plains of Boeotia, Messenia, and eastern Crete. There are tablets from Pylos and Knossos recording chariot repairs. In any event, the significance of the chariot for the Mycenaeans was not in its use in battle, but rather its high prestige value. Paired with the grand palaces and rich burial offerings in the Tholos tombs, the adoption of the chariot proclaimed that the warrior tribes of late Bronze Age Greece were aiming to be the cultural equals of the kings of the Near East. The palace also exacted direct control over the religious organization of the kingdom. The tablets list the gifts of land, animals, precious objects, and human labor from the palace given to the gods to be used for the maintenance of their sanctuaries, and it also lists priests and priestesses. This tight economic and political control exercised by the king over the sanctuaries and priesthoods is an indication that he was able to claim a divine right to rule. When the king officiated at religious ceremonies and sacrifices, he did so as the earthly representative of the kingdom to the gods. Unlike the Near Eastern monarchs, there is no evidence, however, to suggest that the king proclaimed divine ancestry or was considered divine himself by his subjects, either in his lifetime or after death, or that he functioned as a priest king over a theocratic state. While Mycenaean religion is more known than that of the Minoans, it still isn't fully understood either, especially when one takes into consideration that at least six centuries lie between the earliest presence of Proto-Greek speakers in Greece and the earliest Linear B inscriptions. It is believed that some of the deities that the Mycenaeans worshipped were pre-Greek in origin and that the deities, rituals, and beliefs of the Mycenaeans were the result of a fusion of the Aegean fertility mother goddess religion that we have spoken about and the Indo-European worship of sky and weather gods. So the Mycenaeans brought with them into Greece their own religion, in which the more important deities were male. Old and new beliefs merged, and the Mycenaean religion formed the basis of that of the later Greeks. Let's start with what the Mycenaean and Minoan religions had in common. They shared the worship of a mother goddess. The name or title Potnia, referring to a female divinity as lady or mistress, is very common in the tablets, emphasizing the importance of goddesses, like on Crete. Similar cult scenes in the open air of ritual dance, adoration, and epiphany are found in both places. The Mycenaeans also placed her in scenes with outdoor settings that featured trees and other vegetation and animals, reproduced on frescoes and on gold and silver rings. Votive figurines were also common for Minoan goddesses, and the Mycenaeans had Psy and Phi figurines that have been found all over the late Bronze Age Greece. They were typically made of terracotta and were found in tombs, shrines, and settlement areas. They got their names from their shape and a resemblance to the respective Greek letter. Their function and purpose is unknown. Possible uses were children's toys, votive figurines, or grave offerings, but there is nothing Minoan about them. The Minoan religious symbols of stylized bullhorns and double axes occur frequently in Mycenaean art, but they probably were only decorative elements and not religious in nature. A famous example are the Vafio cups, found in a tomb at Vafio in the Peloponnese, and either were made by Minoan artists or Mycenaeans trained in their style. Yet, for all of their similarities, there were significant differences in rituals and practices between Mycenaean and Minoan religions. The Minoans constructed sanctuaries in caves, on mountaintops, and in the country villas. The Mycenaeans had altars inside their palaces, presumably for domestic worship, but built no shrines outside separate from their central dwellings, although shrines altogether are conspicuously rare on the Mycenaean archaeological record. It is generally assumed that the Mycenaeans had no temples or cult statues. Sacred enclosures have been found at Mycenae and Amyclae. However, Linear B records indicate, at least at Pylos and Nasu, 
that there must have been a variety of sanctuaries dedicated to various deities with various priests and priestesses responsible for specific shrines. It can be supposed from archaeological strata that sites such as Delphi, Dodona, Delos, Eleusis, Lerna, and Abai were already important shrines. We will come back to these in several episodes down the road. And in Crete, several Minoan shrines show continuity into the period of Minoan Mycenaean culture. The tablets also indicate that there were religious festivities with offerings. Priests were prominent figures in Mycenaean society, while the role of Mycenaean women in religious festivities was important, just as in Minoan Crete. The names of around 30 gods and goddesses have been recognized in some aspect on Linear B tablets, but they only list offerings being given to the deity, revealing nothing about religious practices. In any event, the Mycenaean pantheon contained many of which were unknown in later times, but some are clearly the names of major deities in later Greek religion, like Zeus, Poseidon, Hera, Ares, Athena, Artemis, Hermes, Dionysius, Persephone, Eletheia, who is the goddess of childbirth, and the Furies. And some are possibly referring to the divinities that would become Demeter, Hephaestus, and Apollo, as well as other minor non-Olympian divinities. Aphrodite, however, was not represented at all in the tablets. We cannot be certain that these gods had the same characteristics and responsibilities attributed to them as in the historical period but the continual appearance of their names show that the male element was stronger than the archaeological evidence has suggested, as the males are conspicuously absent from Mycenaean art. Furthermore, the tablets imply that Poseidon, not Zeus, occupied a place of privilege in the Mycenaean pantheon. In particular, it's interesting to see the importance of Poseidon in the Linear B tablets found at Pylos, because in the Odyssey, when Telemachus comes to the court of Nestor, the king of Pylos. A feast is being celebrated in honor of Poseidon. Mycenaean pottery followed the Minoan style during the 16th and 15th centuries BC, but then Greek potters began to break away from the Minoan naturalistic styles and started creating more abstract, linear designs with sparse decoration. Technically speaking, it was sophisticated, although aesthetically plain. The style also spread to Crete as well, in the 13th century BC, we see the development of a new pictorial style, the main feature of which is a frieze of figures running around the top of the vase. The aforementioned warrior vase is an excellent example of the pictorial style. Warriors and charioteers are the most common subject, but bulls, goats, and deer are almost equal. These vases were particularly popular in the Near East, and most of the surviving examples have been found in Cyprus and Syria. As mentioned before, the Mycenaean kings enacted taxes on the local peoples in terms of raw products, as this is still a pre-monetary society, where they were transformed into finished goods on the citadel. Within the walls of Mycenae, there are a number of workshops, and judging by the Linear B tablets, the manufacturing and commercial operations of the Mycenaeans had a surprising degree of size, complexity, and specialization, including potters, masons, goldsmiths, bronze workers, chariot builders, bow makers, armorers, leather workers, wheelwrights, woodcutters, perfume makers, and other artisans. As mentioned before, some women worked in the textile sector as weavers and embroiderers. Some of these were slaves. Some were not. These people are described as wanarkatero, which presumably means belonging to the king producing exclusively for the palace. The palace scribes meticulously wrote down how much raw materials was provided to the craft specialists, the objects they produced, and the rations of food they received in return. The inventories are expansive, and even damaged materials were noted. We know of many of these products only from their descriptions in the tablets, as they have long ago disintegrated. Several industries had a greater than local significance. A good deal of the Nassos tablets are concerned with how many sheep are in a district, the quantity of expected wool from them, and how this wool would be allocated. A large number of women were employed at Nassos and the surrounding towns in spinning yarn and weaving and decorating the woolen cloth for this purpose. The Wanox of Pylos also controlled a large textile industry, both in wool and in linen. 
Metalworking was another important industry at Pylos, where a large number of smiths, around 400, Receiving the rations of bronze indicates that the production of bronze, including weapons, far exceeded local consumption needs, meaning that they were meant for export. The Mycenaeans were not self-sufficient, as the raw materials for weapons and tools had to come from abroad, and they proved to be very successful traders. The height of their power and prosperity began after they surpassed the Minoans commercially in the Aegean. The size of their manufacturing operations at Pylos and Knossos reveals that textiles and metalwork were the two leading exports of the palace economy, as well as olive oil, wine, hides, leather, and leather products. Luxury items like high-quality painted pottery and jewelry competed well in the international market. It is mainly weapons and pottery, which are virtually indestructible, that have been found in distant places, showing evidence that they engaged in an extended trade network. But the presence of those items means too that other, more perishable goods also reached the trading centers around the Mediterranean. In return, the palaces imported things lacking in Greece, such as copper, tin, gold, ivory, amber, dyes, and spices, as well as foreign varieties of things that they did have, such as wine, textiles, ceramics, and jewelry. However, one would think that with all of these various Mycenaean palaces sending out exports into the Mediterranean, that we would see all sorts of variation. But Mycenaean civilization exhibits a remarkable cultural uniformity on which a sort of cultural unity could be found from east to west in the Mediterranean Sea. Even the experts find it difficult to determine whether a vase or a dagger, found in Miletus, for example, was made locally or came from a palace workshop in Crete or Greece. Even on the mainland, there is remarkable uniformity of fashions in palace architecture, fortifications, armor, pottery and burial customs. Although the Mycenaeans were not unified politically, they were definitely unified culturally. Knowing the extent of the Minoan trading network, we shouldn't be surprised at how expansive the Mycenaean trading network would become, as they essentially stepped right into a well-oiled machine already. The Mycenaeans, though, would dominate the Mediterranean basin on the seas to a greater extent. At the apex of their civilization, From around 1450 to 1250 BC, Mycenaean ships were docking in even more locations throughout the western and eastern Mediterranean. Looking westward, sufficient pottery in the Aeolian Islands off the northern coast of Sicily has been found to suggest regular trading. Further north, off the western coast of central Italy, Mycenaean pot shards have been found on the island of Ischia. The metals of both of these islands were what attracted them there. In Sicily, a substantial number of vases have been found at Thapsus on the eastern coast, and a thin scatter on the southeastern corner of the island. It's possible the Mycenaeans were interested in Sicilian corn, but by far the largest quantity of Mycenaean pottery in the west comes from Teros, Tarentum in Latin, in southeastern Italy, where there may have been a Mycenaean settlement. Mycenaean products also penetrated further west into Malta, Sardinia, and even Spain. Sporadic objects of Mycenaean manufacture were found in various distant locations, like in Central Europe, such as in Germany, where an amber object inscribed with linear B symbols has been unearthed. Mycenaean bronze double axes and other objects dating from the 13th century BC have been found in Ireland and England. Looking eastward, the Mycenaeans had established colonies on Rhodes and the southwestern coast of Anatolia. The import of Mycenaean pottery replaced a desire from Minoan in Egypt, Syria, the Levant, and Cyprus. Egypt could supply gold from Nubia, a wide range of exotic stones for jewelry and ornaments, flint for arrowheads, and papyrus, which was invaluable for the making of sails and ropes. From Syria and the Levant came attractive textiles and ivory. Cyprus was the great center of copper production. Anatolia provided tin and other metals. However, Trade with the Hittite lands in central Anatolia appears to have been limited. There will be more on that next episode. But trade with Troy on the northwestern coast of Anatolia is well attested, while Mycenaean trade routes expanded further to the Bosporus, and Mycenaean swords have been found as far away as the eastern Black Sea coast. All of this can be illustrated by the Uluburin shipwreck, discovered off the southwestern coast of Turkey and dates to the late 14th century BC. 
the cargo was composed almost entirely of metal in the form of copper ingots, bronze tools, and scrap for resmelting, and tin. Ships of all major regional powers traveled counterclockwise along the coast from Syria to Anatolia, to Crete, to Libya, to Egypt, and so on. The ship was probably on its way to Crete. Certain cities, such as the Canaanite Ugarit, acted as hubs to overland trade routes for the Near Eastern peoples of the Kassites, Mitanni, and Assyrians. The increase in Mycenaean trade made many in the Eastern Mediterranean very wealthy during the 14th and 13th centuries BC, to the point that they began to catch the attention of the great regional powers, such as the Egyptians and Hittites. The economy and society of Mycenaean civilization flourished for about 400 years until a series of terrible things began to happen that would lead to its ultimate destruction. On the next episode, the Greeks and the Trojans will come to blows in the infamous Trojan War, which may or may not have happened. We will briefly discuss the myth in its entirety and then look at the historical evidence for conflict. But the Trojans weren't the Greeks' biggest concern. Within a century after they laid claim to their dominance in the Aegean Sea, the Greeks would be fighting for their very existence as an existential threat rained down on their palaces. Where did this threat come from? Find out next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 7, The Late Bronze Age. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes onto your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you are checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks everyone for your continued support, and I hope you are enjoying the podcast. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled, The Death of Agamemnon, from his album, The Ancient Greek Cathara of Classical Antiquity. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientliar.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.